Hello everybody, I am Dr. Jitendra Pandey and I am your instructor for this module on Computer Ethics and Policies. After viewing and understanding this lecture, the learner should be able to define ethics, know the history of computer ethics, differentiate between computer ethics and cyber ethics, understand what is considered to be an unethical behavior for a student or a teacher, know the security issues associated to personal information on public computers, understand safety measures for ethics, define acceptable user policy, define security policy and know the various factors which contributes to effective security policies. The general definition of word ethics defined the elements important to humans' morals. Ethic could be referred to as specific values, standards, rules and agreements. Computer ethics are a set of moral principles that governs an individual or a group on what is acceptable behavior while using a computer. One of the common ethics missed by many among computer ethics is violation of copyright issues. Duplicating the copyrighted contents without the author's approval Accessing personal information of others are some of the examples that violate ethical principles. Now let us have a discussion on history of computer ethics. Computer ethics is a concept that is growing larger every day with new advanced technology. Computer ethics first came about in 1970s as computers were becoming integrated into homes. Computers today are used in homes, in schools, and in almost every company. This field has taken ethics to a whole new level, especially due to the privacy issues found throughout various businesses. This form of ethics is also now offered as a course to study at many universities around the world. Computer ethics include the various physiological aspects of ethics as well as the psychological and sociological interpretations. When the field was first discovered in 1970s, applied ethics was used to describe the new concept. At that time, there was much controversy to what computers would bring to the society. Some thought that computers would create more ethical issues, whereas others thought it put a so-called twist on old ethics. In the 1980s, the computer was thought to be the closest object to a universal tool available to individuals. In essence, the integration of the computer into everyday society was not easy. The generation of computer was new as well as exciting, but nobody had used it before, including businesses and individuals. There would have to be some form of ethical guidelines to using these new products that nobody had much experience with. Nowadays, computer ethics cover a wide variety of topics such as computers in the workplace, computer crime, professional responsibility, and privacy and anonymity. Do you know what is considered as an unethical behavior for students and teachers? Let us discuss some of them in details. I'll start with the first one that is digital plagiarism. Plagiarism is one of the major forms of academic dishonesty which has always existed in education including higher education. For example, assignments submitted by students may turn out to be copied from fellow students or could be taken over in part or in whole from existing published works. The use of computers and internet added to the means that students have at their disposal to commit plagiarism. However, they make it much easier to do and much harder to detect. The second act which is considered to be an unethical behavior is breaking copyright and software theft. Throughout the society, it is well known that the illegal copying of copyrighted media such as text, music works, movies and software programs is widespread. Moreover, many people who engage in such activity do not consider themselves to be doing something that is immoral. This is certainly true for college students. 
and this attitude of students seems to match developments in the current information age in which the internet increasingly functions as the most important information medium that people use. The third unethical act is improper use of computer resources. Students and staff may have authorized access to computer resources but then go on to use these resources improperly. They may have a school or library internet account or they may use computer system, computer network or computer software that is owned by the institution or they may use computerized services offered by the institution and do so in a way that does not meet the institution's standards of proper use of that particular resource. For example, students may use their student account to run their own internet businesses, may open up a popular website or service that generates much traffic, download mp3 files, staff members may use their institution's server or computer system to download, view or store content that is either illegal or against the school's policy or may spread computer viruses or worms. So we have discussed some of the acts that are considered to be unethical use of computing resources. Now let us have some discussion on securing information privacy and confidentiality. Let us start with security issues associated to personal information on public computers. While using publicly accessible computers, students or staff may unknowingly leave personal information on the public computers such as cached web pages and cookies that are then available for inspection by others. Second issue is file sharing. The computers that are used by student or faculty may contain software that allow files from computers accessible to other users on the campus network or outside without knowledge of the owner or they may allow files to be stored on a central server that are then accessible to others without their permission. This could allow strangers to read these files that may contain personal information. The third issue is school web pages and bulletin boards. Web pages maintained by the school, by faculty or by students may contain personal information that may access the privacy of others. Likewise, posting and reposting on bulletin boards or in other electronic forums may contain personal information of third parties for which no authorization has been given. One should always remember the 10 rules of computer ethics. Number one is, one should not use a computer to harm other people. The second one is, one should not interfere with others' computer work. Number three is, one should not snoop around in others' computer files. Number fourth is, one should not use a computer to steal. The fifth one is, one should not use a computer to bear false witness. The sixth one is, one should not copy or use proprietary software for which one have not paid. The seventh one is, one should not use others' computer resources without authorization or proper compensation. The eighth one is, one should not appropriate others' intellectual output. The ninth one is, one should think about the social consequences of the program written. And the tenth one is, one should always use a computer in ways that ensure consideration and respect for one's fellow humans. Some of the rules that the individuals should follow while using a computer are The first one is Do not use computer to harm other users. Do not use computers to steal others information. Do not access files without the permission of the owner. Do not copy copyrighted software without the author's permission. Always respect copyright laws and policy. Respect the privacy of others 
just as you expect the same from others. Do not use other users' computer resources without their permission. Use internet ethically. Complain about illegal communication and activities if found to internet service providers and local law enforcement authorities. Users are responsible for safeguarding their user ID and passwords. They should not write them on paper or anywhere else for remembrance. Users should not intentionally use the computers to retrieve or modify the information of others which may include password information, files, etc. Now, let us discuss some of the internet ethics. Internet ethics means an acceptable behavior for using internet. We should be honest, respect the rights and property of others on the internet. Acceptance World Wide Web is not a waste wild web. It's place where values are considered in a broadest sense. We must take care while shaping contents and services and we should recognize that internet is not apart from universal society but it is a primary component of it. Sensitivity to national and local cultures. It belongs to all and there is no barrier of national and local cultures. It cannot be subject to one set of values like local TV channel, a local newspaper and we have to accommodate multiplicity of uses. Precautions while using email and chatting. Internet must be used for communication with family and friends. We should not use the internet chatting for communicating with strangers and should not forward the emails from strangers. And we must teach children on risk involved by chatting or forwarding emails to strangers. Pretending to be someone else. We must not use the internet to pretend as someone else and fool others. We must teach children that fooling others and hiding your own identity is a crime. Avoid bad language. We must not use rude or bad language while using email, chatting, blogging and social networking. We need to respect their views and should not criticize anyone on the internet and the same should be taught to the children. Hide personal information. We should teach children not to give personal details like home address, phone numbers, interests, passwords to anyone. No photographs should be sent to strangers and they should be taught to hide personal details from strangers because it might be misused and shared with others without their knowledge. While downloading, internet is used to learn about music, video and games by listening to it and learning how to play games. We must not use it for downloading them or share the copyrighted material. Same should be taught to children and they must be aware about the importance of copyrights and issues of copyright. Supervision. You should know what children are doing on the internet and the sites they are visiting on the internet and should check with whom they are communicating. Look over their shoulders and restrict them browsing inappropriate sites. Parental involvement while a child is using the internet helps the children to follow computer ethics. Encourage children to use internet. We must encourage children, students and others to gain the knowledge from the internet and use it wisely. Internet is a great tool where one can gather information which can be used for learning. Access to internet. The internet is a time efficient tool for everyone that enlarges the possibilities for curriculum growth. Learning depends on the ability to find relevant and reliable information quickly and easily and to select, understand and assess that information. Searching for information on the internet can help to develop these skills. Since many sites adopt particular views about issues, the internet is a useful tool for developing the skills of distinguishing facts from opinion and exploring subjectivity and objectivity. Now let us discuss what is cyber ethics. Cyber ethics is a code of behavior for moral, legal and social issues on the internet or cyber technology. Cyber ethics also includes obeying laws that applies to online behavior. By practicing cyber ethics, one can have a safer and enjoyable internet experience. Cyberbullying is the use of information technology 
to repeatedly harm or harass other people in a deliberate manner. With the increase in use of these technologies, cyberbullying has become increasingly common, especially among teenagers. Cyber technology referred to a wide range of computing and communications devices from individual computers to connected devices and communication technologies. Cyber ethics suggests the study of ethical issues limited to computing machines or to computing professionals. It is more accurate than internet ethics, which is limited only to ethical issues affecting computer networks. Cyber safety. Cyber safety addresses the ability to act in a safe and responsible manner on the internet and other connected environments. These behaviors protect personal information and reputation and include safe practices to minimize danger from behavioral based rather than hardware or software based problems. Cyber security. Cyber security covers physical protection of personal information and technology resources from unauthorized access gained via technology. Safety measures for ethics. There are four effective approaches who want to ensure they are doing the right thing online. The first one is have a basic understanding of the technology. Second one is participate with your child online. Third one is determine what standards have been established for any school computer use. Create a set of rules along with your child relating to both ethics and safety. As per the importance of information technology and given the possibilities of unethical use of this technology by students and faculty, student, schools, universities and colleges should ensure that they have policies regarding the use and management of information technology by students and staff. Several ethical codes dealing with technology use exist and many schools have adopted acceptable uses policy that includes rules for the proper use of information technology. Teachers, students and parents need to know and understand these ethical codes. For children, the major issues surrounding technology ethics can be categorized into three areas privacy, property and appropriate use. Schools related cases can be found in each of these areas. Teachers need to develop learning objectives and activities that specifically address technology ethics. Proper use need to be taught at the same time that other computer skills are taught. A students understanding of ethical concepts need to be assessed. Technology use privileges especially those involving online use should not be given to student until the assessment shows that a student knows and can apply ethical standards and institutional policies. In institutions, one should have an acceptable user policy. An acceptable user policy that describes the use of internet and other information technologies and network in an institution. The rules in these policies often apply to both staff and students. Everyone in the institutions as well as parents need to know and understand these policies. An acceptable user policy may contain not using the service as part of violating any law, not attempting to break the security of any computer network or user, not posting commercial messages to institutional groups without prior permission, not attempting to send junk email or spam to anyone who don't want to receive it, not attempting to mail bomb a site with mass amounts of email in order to flood their server. Do not use computer technology to cause interference with other users work. Do not use computer technology to steal information. Organizations are becoming increasingly sophisticated in the way in which they organize and use information technology. They are spending too much on IT just to take benefits from the latest technologies and to boost their businesses and grow leaps and bounds. We can see it around us in real time. Now for booking a cab, we rarely have to tell the cab driver our pickup address manually. App detects it automatically. Most of the providers use location based system or GPS to track the user and set the address as a pickup location.
it is just matter of minutes that booked cab arrives at your place. People have never thought of these 10 years ago. Even organizations are using technology this much. Still, most of the organization are not having dedicated budget for security as they don't see any direct return on investment. Once organization goes through major attack, then they start thinking about security and start spending budget on security things. As a part of company, people should be aware of their security responsibility. For proper security in organization, people, process and technology should be focus area of improvement. In these days, employees are most targeted because they are easily exploitable. Now one question may arise in your mind. Where to start in security? If organization want to secure their asset, so what should be the starting point of that particular organization? Yes, you are right. There should be some policy document which should be followed and in this document, it should also be mentioned that what will happen if this particular document is not followed. Now let us start with defining policy first. Policies are high level document to represent corporate philosophy of that particular organization. Policies are kept more clear and concise to keep them effective. Basic elements of a policy are purpose, scope, responsibility and compliance. Policies are set up with the objectives of reduced risk, compliance with law and regulation and assurance of operational continuity, information integrity and confidentiality. Policies are also known to be the first layer of defense. Policies are important reference document for internal audits and for resolution of legal disputes about management's due diligence. Security policy is the statement of responsible decision makers about the protection mechanism of a company, crucial physical and information assets. Overall, it is a document that describes a company's security controls and activities. For an organization, it addresses the constraints on behavior of its members as well as constraints imposed on adversities by mechanisms such as doors, locks, keys and walls. For system, the security policy addresses constraints on functions and flow among them, constraint on access by external systems and adversities including programs and access to the data by people. The success of an information resources protection program depends on the policies and on the attitude of the management towards securing information on system. In order to produce a complete information security policy, management must define three types of information security policy. Number one is enterprise information security program policy. Number two is issue specific information security policy. And number third is systems specific information security policies. In enterprise information security program policy, management establishes how a security program will be set up, lays out the program's goal, assign responsibilities, shows the strategic and tactical value of security and outlines how enforcement should be carried out. It also provides scope and direction for all future security activities within the organization. This policy must address relative laws, regulations and liability issues and how they are to be satisfied. It also describes the amount of risk senior management is willing to accept. Issue specific information security policies addresses specific security issues that management feels need more detailed explanation and attention to make sure a comprehensive structure is built and all employees understand how they are to comply with these security issues. For example, an email policy might state that management can read any employee's email messages that reside on the mail server but not when they reside on user's workstation. System specific information security policy presents the management's decision that are specific to the actual computers, networks, applications and data. This type of policy may provide an approved software list which contains a list of applications that may be installed on individual workstations. For example, 
this policy may describe how databases are to be used and protected, how computers are to be locked down, and how firewalls, IDS, and scanners are to be employed. For making policies, there are many factors which contribute. The first important factor is goal. Goal addresses the important concerns like, has the issue been adequately defined and properly framed? How will the policy achieve the high-level policy goals of the department and the government as a whole? The next important factor is ideas. Idea addresses the important concern like, has the policy process been informed by evidence that is high quality and up to date? Has the account been taken of evaluation of previous policies? Has there been an opportunity or license for innovative thinking? Have policy makers sought out and analyzed ideas and experience from the frontline, overseas and devoted administrations? The next important factor is design. Design addresses the important concerns like have policymakers rigorously tested or assessed whether the policy design is realistic involving implementers and the end users? Have the policymakers addressed common implementation problems? Is the design resilient to adaptation by implementers? Another important factor is external engagement and it addresses the important concerns like have those affected by the policy been engaged in the process? Have policymakers identified and responded reasonably to their views? Next is appraisal. It is concerned about the important issues like have the options been robustly assessed? Are they cost effective over the appropriate time horizon? Are they resilient to changes in the external environment? Have the risk been identified and weighted fairly against potential benefits? Next is roles and accountabilities. It is concerned about important issues like have policymakers judged the appropriate level of government involvement? Is it clear who is responsible for what? Who will hold them to account? and how. Next is feedback and evaluation. It is concerned about important issues like is there a realistic plan for obtaining timely feedback and how the policy is being realized in practice. Does the policy allow for effective evaluation even if government is not doing it? Last but not the least is the policy is read by the targeted staff or the audience. Policies are only useful if the people for whom it's targeted read those policies. It's effective when people read the policies and understood those policies. People should be agreed to the formulated policies, then only they will be effective. As in this dynamic environment, upon the need, policies should be updated from time to time if required to make them effective. So in this lecture, we have discussed about computer and cyber ethics and security policies. I hope these concepts are clear in your mind now. Thank you.